Now you're probably thinking save lives where? Save lives here in this physical world as well as the spiritual world. That's what I do. There was a, um, a lady that came up and vis visited me from L.A. And she wanted to have a weekend getaway with her daughter. Her daughter's 12. And she loves riding her horse. So she came all the way up from L.A. just to ride her horse and spend the weekend with her daughter. And she said, hey, Roland, do you mind if I just lock up the barn area and, you know, I'll see you later. And I go, Jody, go right ahead. It's, it's all good. Because I love this woman. She's great. She does a good job. Well, 10 minutes later, right down the road, I receive a phone call. Roland, I don't know what to do, but I, 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 I can't get up. What do you mean you can't get up? Well, I don't want to bother you. But, and I know you're really busy, but I, I can't get up. Jody, have you tried to get up before? Yeah, I tried to get up, and I just fell down again. Jody, do not get up. I'm coming around. Really, you're 10 minutes away. I don't want, want to make Jody. It's no problem, really. I'm coming back around for you. Okay, I'll wait. So I come driving up to the barn area, and it's about 10 minutes in, and there she is laying on her side. And her head cocked off, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, do I call 911? Now, I teach CPR, first aid, and all that life-saving rescue stuff to the police academy, to Oregon Youth Authority, and all the Salem-Kaiser districts. That's who I teach. And I'm thinking, now wait a minute, you're only supposed to call 911 if the place is unsafe. Well, the place was safe. Were you only supposed to call 911 if the person is conscious or unconscious and she's conscious? So I don't need to call. The third one, do I have the tools to deal with the situation? I'm thinking, yes, I'm a trainer. I have the tools. So I go walking up to Jody and go, Jody, hey, I'm first aid trained. I'm a first, I'm a first responder. <gasps> you are. I didn't know you ever did that. I just thought you did horses. I, no, I'm a, first, I'm a first responder. Oh, thank goodness. I don't know why I can't get up, but I can't get up. Jody, you mind if I check? Let me check the backside, see if there's any blood or anything that's going on. We just need to make sure that you're okay before I call 911. So right there, I had to do a thing called DOTS. It's a head-to-toe assessment. DOTS. Today you're studying told dot. I'm actually doing dot with a plural. Dots. So you're going to remember told dot or told dots off of dots. And we do a head to toe assessment. And I'm going to check Jody out from head to toe before I make that 911 call. So I'm checking for things called deformity, open wound, tenderness, ow, swelling, oh my, you're getting bigger. What am I checking for? D is for? O is for? T is for? Ow? S is for? Oh, my word, you're getting bigger. Jody, do you mind if I check your head? Yeah, check the head. I can bend it. Okay, that's good. Jody, can you check? Can I check your eyes? What, with my fingers. He says, you only have one finger. What are you talking about, stupid? I go, good, you can see my one finger. Good for you. Joe, can I, can I check your ears? Can I check your collarbones? Can I check your shoulder blade? Can I check your rib cage, your abdomen, your hip? Ow! Don't touch my hip! Oh, you're tender there, aren't you? Can I check your thigh? Oh, ooh, that hurts. Don't touch that either. Your knee, your calf. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness. And she starts shaking like this and she's starting to go into shock. Now, shock means we have to assess what's going on in the situation. So I look to her little girl and I say, I want you to go get a what? A horse? Yeah, because I'm at a barn. So let's go get a horse blanket. Do I want one, two, or three? Three. Thanks for paying attention to the person on the ground. Because she had her head cocked like this and her leg was cocked over the other leg. And she's starting to shiver. So I cover up with one and I fold up a blanket, stick it under her head because she said she could move it. And I put one under. Now, most of you guys know for shock, we're supposed to elevate the legs. Should I elevate her legs? Yes or no? No. Because she cannot use her hip. And it's a big what? Ow. So I didn't elevate her legs. 
I just covered it up and I started to have a conversation with her. Jody, how did this happen? Now, you know you have here in the valley, there's about five to six minutes before EMTs arrive. Now, if you live in a third world country like L.A., Chicago, Detroit, or San Francisco, <laughs> they don't get to you till 50 minutes, and that's a fact. So right now, I had to carry on a conversation with Jody for at least five minutes, and so we get to talk about her and what she's suffering and what she's feeling. I don't get to talk about me. I only get to talk about her. And guess what? The EMT showed up and they wanted to know something that we call sample. Symptoms, allergies, medications, past history, last oral intake, and the events leading up to the problem. Well, events leading up to the problem is the biggest story. And that's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you the story. So the events that led up to the problem, Jody was putting her horse away and she put her inside the stall. She'd brushed her down, was going to put her blankets on top of her. And the horse jumped and knocked her over like a tree. And she fell right on her side just perfectly. Jody, do you want me to shoot the horse for you? Because that's a nasty horse. No, Jody. I mean, Neralin, you can't shoot the horse. That's not nice. Okay, I know it's not nice, Jody. I won't shoot the horse. But what happened? Well, someone was on the rooftop and something flew through the air and it scared my horse and it just knocked me down. Wow. Yeah. So, Jody, we got to wait for the EMTs. That one little weekend, that weekend getaway with her and her daughter, does anyone want to venture and guess what she had to pay for that physically? A complete hip replacement. So she had to stay up at OHSU for three weeks. And she also broke her femur bone. And they severed in just the right place that the medical personnel told me that if I would have tried to elevate her legs, elevate her legs, like most shock victims, I might have severed her female artery. It seems like a simple injury, right? But it was actually more complicated than I thought. It's the most painful. So did I have the tools? No, I had to call the EMTs. So I'm telling you this story because I want you to understand something about our flesh and our spiritual body. Give me just a chance to share it with you, and then you guys can get into Midrash and see what you guys come up with. But when I look at deformities in our spiritual state, I'm thinking about this. Yeah, that's a physical state. But where are our deformities in a spiritual state? We have physical deformities, but we also, I believe, have spiritual ones. And that's what I want to get into just a little bit today. What kind of deformity are you having within your life? Are you afraid to be seen? Now, I put this slide up here because many times when we have deformities in our lives, we don't like to be seen. We go hide. Do you know that human beings hide when they get close to death or when a real emergency happens? That's weird to me. We can complain, we can cough out loud, but when you're getting ready to die, you, you usually run to a room and hide. Do we run and hide when we have a deformity? Or is this the time that we need to seek out spiritual counsel with one another? Open wounds. They hurt, they bleed, and they're open. Interesting. How many of us still have open wounds? that have not been covered up to keep the infection from going inside. Think about that for a minute. We carry these open wounds around in our flesh, but it also affects our spiritual life because we're thinking to myself, shoot, someone really hurt me. I have an open wound here and I'm not going to trust the Savior anymore. Does that happen? It's just a question. Yeah, it's just the way I am. But it's maybe, yeah, it is an open wound. You know, many times we don't think about that. So when you're ministering, when you're going out and telling it to the masses and someone comes up to you and says, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Have you ever thought that they might be dealing with either a deformity or open wound? They actually might be dealing with something that's a tenderness, a tendered subject 
that's just a little bit too close to home, okay? My family left me, or my brother hurt me, or my marriage partner left me and hurt me, those sorts of things, and you're tender in those areas. So when you're going out and telling it to, to the masses, are we conscious of tenderness? Do we need to be tender as we touch those open wounds or the wounds that are around them? Are you checking for dots on a head-to-toe assessment? Let's look at the last one. S, swelling. Oh, my, you're getting bigger. You ever let something fester in your life? And do you think that other people allow things to fester in their life and that thing just gets bigger and bigger and bigger? And pretty soon you don't know what to do with it. It can be pride. It can be some of those things that just swell things to where you don't look so good. That's swelling. Dots. Now, there's a couple things here that I think that get in our way. If you got your Bibles, I want you to open them up because I'm going to go grab mine. All right. Oops, I don't have one. It's okay. I want guys want you to look up 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14. All right? Are you with me? It's in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. Okay? And it's back there where all the other books are. There's a whole bunch of them. Ones, twos, and ones and twos, and some more ones and twos. Okay? And the threes. Yeah. <laughs> But first, first Corinthians 2.14. Just want to pass these thoughts on to you guys. You guys, everyone there? Yeah. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of whom? Yahweh, Elohim. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually apprised. But he who is spiritually apprises all things, yet he himself is apprised by no man. For who has known the mind of Yahweh, that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Yeshua, our Messiah. Interesting. How does this happen? How does this happen that we actually get to a point where we can accept Yeshua as the Messiah? I'm going to share just a couple things with you because I've struggled with them. Um, I don't know, have, have any of you guys read Ave Ben Mordecai's book yet, Going Home? When he came here, we purchased those. Some of them did. Okay? Typically, because of my past experiences, I read most books really fast. I mean, it's just, I'm done, good, all right, got it. Because in graduate school, you have to get all those things down really quick, write a summary, and be done with it. Avi's book, <laughs> I can only read three to four pages. I got to close it. I got to go think about it. I have to come back and read the three or four pages again. Close it. Go back. Read it again. Yeah, and savor it. And I have to think about it. And I'm wondering why that happens to me, because his book called Going Home has to do with going back to Genesis. And there's two things that happen within Genesis, correct? We have the tree of, and the tree of, it's interesting how, which, which one of you said which tree first? Which came first, the tree of life or the tree of knowledge and good of e evil? Which one? I like to think the tree of life. Okay, so the tree of life came first, and then there's a, the knowledge of good, of good and evil, correct? What is interesting about that particular picture is that one tree gives us who is life? Yeshua, because he is the representation of Elohim who came down to earth to save us. That's life. And then there's another thing that's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, notice the term. This is what Ave talks about. Good and. So there's a mix. There's a mix. Now, that should make us stop and think for a minute. How do we get a mix? We get entangled. Ave had also brought up some things that were really interesting. Are you the son of Yahweh or are you the son of Adam? 
Remember that talk that he had with us? Okay. And it's interesting to note that many times we're kind of both, if you want to get technical, right? Yahweh breathed what into Adam? Life. And then Adam and Eve decided to make a choice to have a mix of what? Good and evil. Okay? Now, we came to, from the loins of whom? I say loins because that's who we came from. Adam and Eve. So in our makeup, what is our makeup? A mix of? Okay? Now, let's look at a couple of things that you're going to be going on to. And I'm, I'm mostly sharing you guys ideas. All right, because you're going to discuss this within the, the mid, Midrash. When you guys look at Esau and Jacob, they're wrestling in a womb, correct? Could we say that they're wrestling in the earth that they knew? They're in a womb, right? So here they are wrestling. Now, it's fascinating to, to me that both men are complete opposites. Complete opposites. Esau is the man of what? Flesh. Okay, he likes to hunt flesh. He likes to talk about flesh. He likes to go ahead and be flesh. And he doesn't think about anyone else other than his own flesh. He is the man of flesh. Say it. Okay? Now remember, later within Scripture, Yahweh says, I hate Esau. Why? Because he's the man of what? The flesh. So it makes total sense. And if I look at this 1 Corinthians text again, what are we? We cannot ex accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to us. Why? Because we're in the what? The flesh. So that's the difference. Okay, so when we start looking at Jacob, what do we have? Man of the Spirit. This is a person who likes to be in the tent, and he likes to study the things that are spiritual, and he even wrestles with angels. So he's looking for spiritual, and he looks at the top of the ladder, and he sees spiritual. He sees Yeshua, and he wants to respond to that. Yeah, there's, well, what are we? We're still a mix. So if I'm looking at that mix, we have two examples. We have a man that's strictly of, of the flesh. We have one that, that seeks, and this is where I want to correct us. Someone who seeks the Spirit. Someone who seeks Yeshua. Whenever you look up the words righteousness, and this is what I'm learning again from Ave as we talk and as we go over his book, and that is those who are considered righteous were those who sought help. They needed a Messiah. They recognized the need of a Messiah, and that's what I want to stress. The man of the flesh does not recognize the need of a Messiah. Notice that, you should, that Esau put away his birthright. I don't want it. Jacob wanted it even though he wasn't worthy of it. Would you agree? Okay? So he's thinking to myself, all the men that were righteous, Lot, Noah, Abraham, were they sinless? Were they righteous? Why were they righteous? Because they sought, they seeked. Okay? When David was going, I, I'm a, he's a man after God's own heart. In Hebrew, what does that mean? Running after God's heart, Yahweh's heart. He's seeking the heart, pressing on. Every one of the people that I'm amazed at within Scripture recognizes a need. What's the need? I need Yeshua. I need the Messiah. Wow. Look to Isaiah 9, 6. Okay, that's one of those prophet books. It's towards the end of the, the Old Testament is where you can find it. Okay, and I like to talk in simple terms like that, even when I'm talking with people outside of this place. Okay, Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called what? Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. You guys don't know that song? <laughs> wow. 
Hallelujah. 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 Wow. <laughs> I know. I just can't help it. Yeah. Right? Yes. It's powerful. Look at what you see in this text. Now, there are some people that necessarily believe. Now, we have a lot of discussion on who is the Messiah. We have a lot of discussion. Now, catch on to this phrase first. Was he a man of flesh who became God? Or was he God who became flesh? Notice, even within Scripture, one of the greatest prophets of all, in fact, he's termed as the greatest prophet of all. Who was he? Moses, Moshe, right? He even offered himself up to Yahweh and said, take me instead, okay? What did Yahweh say? Not going to take you. Why? Because you're a man of what? Say it. Flesh. Your sacrifice is no good. Because you're a man of flesh. Now, this is the best Moses that you could get. These people are pretty good. And Yahweh still says, I ain't taking your sacrifice. Okay, I'm not taking your sacrifice because your sacrifice is what? No good. So if I look at this text again, and it would support what you're saying. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called what? Wonderful Counselor Almighty whom? Can that be a man? Can't be a man. Can't be a man. It has to be God coming in the flesh. It has to be a perfect sacrifice. The only one who can stop the entanglement of two trees. The only one who can actually go into the pit of hell and rescue you with the keys and fight everything in the spiritual life. You have two universes. We have this earth that we live in and we have a spiritual life in the heavenlies. How do we know that those two are separate? Do you remember Elisha? He had a prophet. He had a young prophet with him. And he says, I'm going to open up your eyes so you can see what? The mighty angels surrounding this city. Do you remember that? Okay. And even Yeshua said, if you would open your eyes, you would see me. And they couldn't see him. So when I look back at that text in 1 Corinthians, do you guys have it again? Let's look at it again because we're going to stay really simple. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Because I want you to yell it to the masses. Just like that last song that we were singing. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. How do we become a spiritual man? That's the question. How do you become a spiritual man? By seeking. Seek ye first. Seek ye first and the kingdom of Yah. Right? And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia. Alleluia. Remember those? It makes sense, right? So if I seek him, and I know that there is only one God that can untangle the mess, and that's Yeshua, then I understand that I need Yeshua in my life, in my heart to change my old man to become a new man. Does that happen overnight? How long have you been in, in generation with Adam? How long? A long, long time. And so as you put Yeshua on and he starts to change your heart, some of us, we go leaping and, jo and jumping for joy. But some of us, we've been entangled for a long time. Therefore, we need to put on dots and do a head-to-toe assessment. What's the deformity? What's the open wound? What's the tenderness? Ow, in my swelling, you're getting big. So if I'm looking at people and I'm sharing, go on and tell it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses. We have got to come to the conclusion that there is only one Messiah. And he's not a man who became holy. It is a God who became.
is holy and dwelt in flesh so that he could conquer and save us from our sin. That's the only way that we can be saved. When you guys look at Hosea today, and you might, because that's part of your Haftorah, ask yourself some questions. Who is the lily of the valley? Who is it that sprouts? Who is it that does those things and who allows those things to happen? Can a man actually do that? When the term Israel is being used, where was that first used? To Jacob. Who did Jacob re wrestle with? He wrestled with that spiritual side, just like Esau and Jacob in the womb. They're wrestling. You guys have, and I have, two things that we want to wrestle with. Our flesh and our spiritual man. Our flesh and our spiritual man. This is why Paul goes on to even say things like, why do I do the things that I do? Because he's still wrestling with his flesh. Okay? Therefore, we need the spiritual man. How do we find the spiritual man? Look at what Jacob did to find that. He would not let the angel of Yahweh go. Not only did he seek him, but he held on. He didn't give up. He held on. And then he looked into the heavenlies, and there he was looking down at him and saying, here's my portal to you. I'm coming down to you. So the question is, how often do we let go? Do we let go? Why do we let go? And do you claim the name of Israel? Israel, in my mind, is not a place, a thing. It's an attitude. Jacob. Every time I see that word, I put in Jacob. And then I remember that one thing. He wrestled. And he didn't let go. And he sought. And he fought his flesh because his flesh looked like garbage. It like all those things that I just showed you. Deformities. Look at them again. That's us in our flesh. We're deformed. We have open wounds of hurt that we haven't let be healed. We have tenderness, things that get to us, and so therefore we put each other aside and we don't love each other. We have swelling because we're all strung out with pride and things that we think is correct within Scripture. And guess what? We will be set straight when Yeshua shows up. Yeah. So the question that I have for you guys to do today is, how do you move from physical to spiritual? Or can we even do that? So as you go through the Midrash, I ask you to look for those things. For to me, that's the general theme that's there. How do we do this? How can we move from our physical needs and wants and actually move to that spiritual side that Yahweh is just waiting to do for us by covering us with the robe of righteousness through Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, who's willing to put that robe around you and just cover you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah that we have that kind of message. Are you shouting it from the mountains? Are you singing it to the masses? Are you giving your testimony like what we just did? That's my question. How do we change this picture? So you guys be super blessed. Yeah, you have questions? Go ahead. Yeah. For those of you who might not have heard Donna, she's, she's saying we have to be careful of not losing our spiritual sight like Isaac. Okay, because as Isaac got older, okay, he wasn't able to see if it was Esau or Jacob. Let's put that into different terms. He wasn't able to see the flesh or the spirit. Okay? So what happens when we get blind? How does that happen? Which is a great question. Because I, I don't think that's just a comment. It's actually a question. How do we keep our spiritual sight open? So how do we stop coming in? And this is what's amazing. If you guys were actually standing up here right now and looking at you, okay, I see many things that happen to us. 
Some of us are falling asleep. Some of us look a little bit dead from all the food that we ate over Thanksgiving. Some of us are going, man, I'm really busy and I don't know if I want to be here. Or, hey, you're talking about things that maybe don't interest me, so therefore I'm cutting out. Think about that for a minute. Some of you went and sang. Some of you gave, gave testimony. Some of you didn't sing. You're called to come into worship to worship. Not to actually take your time coming in and say, hey, you know, we'll get there when we can. No. You're called to come into worship. You're called to come in and listen and to share and to give testimony and to love on one another and, and to be with one another. How was your week? What did you experience? What are your praises that you want to lift up? Tell me about them. I want to know. What are your struggles? Can I pray for you right, right now? That's what it's about. Rather than us being talking heads here and talking about just Torah things all the time. I mean, really. Think about it. It's good to talk Torah because that strengthens you. Gives you encouragement. I'm not knocking that. I'm just asking for us to think about some of those other common things. Like, how are you doing? If you're family, we got to act like family and put our arms around each other. Oh, man, I love this. You guys, I just want to bless you. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we're going to close this and you're going to go into the midrest. Thank you, Angie, for giving people some hugs. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what these things are, right? So what do you guys think about? What does dots mean? What does D mean? O. T. S. And what are you going to do with each person? You're going to do a head to assessment. Yeah. And you're going to figure out how can I minister to you? How can I sing this from the mountains? How can I tell it to the masses? Because you have a message to give. What is that Messiah? What is the message? Yeshua, our Messiah, is King, Lord of Lords, and he will save you. He heals you. And he covers you. And that's why I'm telling you about him. Amen? Let's bow our heads, guys. Father Yah, we want to thank you for your Shabbat. What a blessed time this is. Thank you for ministering within our midst. Father, give us the encouragement and the courage to step outside of our flesh, to step outside of our selfishness and actually minister to others only through the power that you give through Yeshua, the, the Messiah. Father, if we're scared, we ask for encouragement. If we don't know what to say, we ask for words. If we don't know what to do, we ask for actions. Father, let that be part of our makeup. Father, please get rid of this flesh. We can hardly wait till Yeshua comes and heals everyone. That's amazing. Father, bring your spirit here, your rock. Change these measly lives of ours. Let us walk in strength in the spirit. Thy blessed name. Amen.